And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. He's going to talk a little bit about his, himself and his work, but just a quick introduction to him. He's been a scientist and education, educator for over 30 years, and he's developed an international profile in the field of biodiversity, focused particularly on understanding and conserving plant pollin pollinator interactions. His highly cited and groundbreaking research has been used by national and international agencies to support efforts to conserve pollinators and their pollination services. His book, Pollinators and Pollination, Nature and Society, is going to be published very shortly and it will be well worth reading. I've got a date now for 18th of January 2021, so, but it's certainly you know, going to be very shortly available and I'm sure that's going to be a really good buy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand you over to Jeff. So this, yeah, you need to unmute yourself, Jeff, and then... There we go. Thank you, Marie. Yeah. Uh, you've been reading my publisher's website, haven't you? I have, <laughs> I have to admit, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, the book, the book should be out very shortly. In fact, I, I have... Uh, a physical copy of it here. It actually, Ooh. it does exist. It does exist. There's only two Excellent. of them. They're advanced copies. Uh, but my understanding is that it'll be shipped in um, in December, in in time for for Christmas. Excellent. Uh, so thank you very much for the for the introduction and and for the uh, the invitation to talk to you all tonight. It's uh, it's great to see so many people coming in from. Uh, from not just London, from uh, I spotted Iceland and, and Finland and Mexico in, in there. It's fantastic. Um, so I, yeah, as Marie said, I just want to say a little bit about you know who I am and what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So um, I'm currently visiting professor of biodiversity at the University of Northampton, uh, and I stepped down from my full time professorship um, earlier this year. Um, but I've, I've maintained a visiting professorship there and I'm now working as an independent consultant scientist uh, and author, uh, particularly focusing on conservation of, of pollinators. So I've still got one foot in the in the academic research camp, if you like, uh, and I'd be working with with colleagues in China, in particular also South America on on research projects. Um, but I'm also going to be working much more with um, large organizations, with large landowners and and um, ecological consultancies um, advising on, on pollinator conservation. Um, but my, my interest in pollinators goes back really 30 years or more. I started my PhD in 89, finished it in 93. Uh, that was at Oxford Brookes University, um, where I was, I was focused on, on plant reproductive ecology and, and pollination biology. Uh, but since then, I've been incredibly fortunate to have travelled widely doing research, field work uh, on uh, pollinator diversity, um, evolution of pollination systems, uh, evolution of flowers as well. Uh, we've worked in Africa, in South America, Australia, Asia, Canary Islands, and in the UK as well. I've done a fair bit in the UK. Um, published something around 120 research papers and book chapters. Uh, and so on, uh, on a range of topics, not just on, on plant pollinator interactions. My, my interest is in biodiversity broadly, but I guess my, my specialism is, is on pollinators. And as well as our academic work running alongside it, um, I've been working a lot with organisations like the Wildlife Trust, um, local NGOs, River and Regional Park and so on, local nature partnership. Um, on various projects uh, related to, you know, on the ground practical work dealing with um, with pollinator conservation and the best strategies for for conserving pollinators. Um, I'm not a beekeeper, um, so if anybody's got any questions about beekeeping, I'm not the best person to ask. I know a little bit about it, but I'm not a beekeeper. Uh, but I'm an active blogger. My blog um, website is there. Uh, and as Marie, Marie Canley said, the, uh, the book uh, is coming out in December, published by Pelagic uh, Publishing down in, in Exeter. So let's dive into it then. Uh, what are pollinators? What do we mean by, by pollinators? 
Well, it, it will come as no surprise to, to people listening um, that uh, plants need some help to find mates. Uh, the plants can't move around to find mates the way that most animals can, so they've got to recruit help. Um, so pollinators really are facilitators of plant reproduction. And for about 90% of the flowering, flowering plants, and we estimate there's something like 352,000 species of flowering plants widely, uh, for about 90% of those, those facilitators of, of plant reproduction are insects and vertebrates, the, the pollinators. Um, most of the rest are wind pollinated. Anybody who suffers from hay fever will know that, <coughs> excuse me, anyone who suffers from hay fever will know that uh, many plants are, are wind pollinated, but they are in, in, a, in a minority. Uh, there are some water pollinated plants as well, some aquatic plants are water pollinated and they use water currents for, for moving their, their pollen around. Now, uh, if we look at that um, slide there, uh, that picture there, we can see um, a bee fly, Bombylius major, actually pollinating um, a, a cherry flower in my garden last summer. Um, or is it pollinating? It's certainly visiting a flower. Uh, is it actually pollinating? Um, think about that question. I'll come. I'll come back to it in a in a little while to think about how is it that we actually determine whether. Um, animals are effective pollinators or not. And when I talk about animals in this context, I'm including insects within that, the kingdom animalia, which includes the insects as well as the, as the vertebrates. So let's think about um, the diversity of uh, pollinators in, <coughs> in Britain. Um, Obviously, when you know, often when we think about pollinators, uh, we think about bees first and foremost, um, and we have a reasonable diversity of bees in this country, about two hundred and seventy species. Um, we're not sure, certain for for sure because we know that or we think that some have gone extinct, and we're also adding bees to our list every other year. Um, which I'll come back to a little bit later, but about 270 species is a, is a reasonable estimate. Um, that compares to something like 20,000 worldwide. Uh, and again, more and more species being, uh, being added to the world list every year as we uh, describe new, new species. So reasonable diversity. And often when we think about bees, we think about honeybee as being the classic Bee, the bee that we all know. But actually, for, for many reasons, honeybees are not representative of bees as a whole, for, for many reasons. reasons. As we'll see in a moment, honeybees are unusual in that they're, they're social, they have a social structure, but they're also unusual in that they're relatively large. And if you look at this, this graph here, this is just graphing up um, uh, bee sizes. I took the, the data from Stephen Falk's um, recent book, um, where four, length of the four wing is a, is a good measure for, for bee size. That blue line shows you the uh, length of an average honeybee, um, about, about a centimetre uh, four, four wing length. Uh, as you can see, not many other bees are larger than that. Most of the bumblebees are larger than that. Uh, and the biggest bee in this data set is the violet carpenter bee, which hasn't actually, isn't actually considered a, a native species yet. Uh, it's bred in the past, but it, we haven't got a persistent population. But the majority of, the, of bees in, in Britain are actually much smaller than that, even down to sort of four millimetre wing length. Uh, and even that is quite large for some bees in the tropics, when there are, you know, the bees in the tropics are only a few millimetres in, in total length. Um, so, so in many ways, bee, uh, honeybees are not a good model for, for what we think uh, a bee should be, should be like. Um, so we can break our bees down really into four very broad groups. So honeybees, uh, say which are, which are social, they have a social structure with a queen and workers and so on. Um, most of those in, in Britain are in, in hives, um, but increasingly we're seeing more and more wild co colonies um, inhabiting hollow trees. Um, 
and I think there's probably more wild bees living out there than we than we actually think. It's a conversation I occasionally have with uh, with beekeepers who tell me that most of the wild bee colonies are dead, uh, but I see them every year. Uh, and I, I think there's more out there than we perhaps give them credit for. <coughs> uh, the other group uh, is the bumblebees, bombus species, uh, which again are social. In the main, they have a uh, a nest structure that includes a queen and, and workers, uh, but some of them are parasitic within the subgenus Cythera. So we've got about six species of, of those. And I'll come on to the, the parasitic uh, bees in a, in a moment. But they have a range of different uh, nesting strategies, in, some in long grass, others in rodent holes, uh, cavities in, in buildings and trees. Uh, and we've got 27 species of those of which um, three are extinct. By far the most diverse group of bees that we have in this country though are the so-called solitary bees. Uh, in general like Andrina and Anthophora and Osmia, the mason bees and the mining bees and uh, carpenter bees, um, leaf cutting bees, Megachylae and so on. Some of them are ground nesting, some of them nesting cavities. <clears throat> uh, about 15 different genera uh, and 170 uh, 70 species there. Some of these species actually are not solitary at all. We term them primitively eusocial. They do have uh, the beginnings of social structure. Um, and so there's this kind of continuum between so uh, solitary bees and, and social bees, with some, uh, some bees having a sort of a social, social structure. Uh, but then the final group there are the cuckoo bees. And as the name suggests, these bees behave like the cuckoo bird. Uh, they are parasitic on other bee species. They actually go into the nests of um, either social bees, in the, in the case of Cytherus, which, which takes over bumblebee nests, or um, solitary bees in the, in the case of things like Melectra and, and Nomada. Um, and they parasitize those, those bee species. They kill um, the, uh, the queen or the, or the, the female in the case of the so, uh, solitary bees uh, and they'll lay their own eggs within the nest uh, and their own um, offspring feed on the, um, uh, the, the pollen resources that have been, been stored up. Um, so it's a, it's a parasitic life, lifestyle and there's about 70 species within, within that group. Uh, and what I've done in this, this figure is just to uh, show you a little bit about the, the linkages between those parasitic cuckoo bees, uh, which are on the, um, on the right hand side there, um, and uh, their, their hosts, um, solitary bees and, and bumblebees there. And you can see in the case of things like Cytherus there, it's a specialist, it only um, um, parasitizes uh, bombus, the, the bumblebees, uh, whereas at the bottom there, Nomada uh, is a real generalist. Some species will will uh, um, parasitize things like Melita species, others Eucera species, or Andrina, and so on. So there's a real range of, of interactions going on there. So as well as the interactions between the flowers and these bees, there's also the interactions between the the bees themselves and their and their parasites, and it's what Darwin famously called uh, an entangled web. Uh, he talked about the entangled web of, of life, um, all of these interactions coming together. Um, move on to the next major group of of pollinators, then, which are the hoverflies. Again, similar sort of diversity of hoverflies, about two hundred and seventy um, sp species. Um, and again, we, we can break them down, <coughs> excuse me, break them down into three very broad groups. <coughs> um, those which uh, mimic bees, uh, which belong to a range of different genera there, Volucella, Meridon, and, and so on. Uh, those which mimic wasps, um, including some very, very common hoverflies that you'd see in your, uh, in your garden, things like the marmalade hoverfly, for example. Um, and these bee and wasp mimics are mimicking bees and wasps for a couple of different reasons. One reason is uh, so that they don't get predated upon by, uh, by bees, which might 
uh, by sorry by birds, which might mistake them for uh, wasps or bees, which uh, which can sting or, or uh, otherwise cause them harm. Uh, but there's another group like like the hornet hoverfly there at the bottom, uh, which actually mimic their hosts, and again they're either parasitic or they share a nest with a with a bee or a or a wasp. Um, host and they lay their eggs within them the larvae actually um, feed on either on the developing larvae of the bees and wasps or on the um, the remains of the pollen and, and so on that that's that's left behind uh, and there's some which do it in ant nests as well but actually the third broad group of of hoverflies are those that don't mimic anything at all and quite often these are small and black or brown um, and really often quite difficult to uh, to identify in, in my experience. I'm not an expert on hoverflies at all. Um, so just to, to give you a, a sense of how diverse the natural histories of, of these flies actually are, again this is uh, data looking at the number of species that have uh, larva life histories associated with particular things that they feed on or particular habitats. So um, just starting on, on the left there you can see that um, by far far and away the largest group of, of hoverflies, something around 120 species, are actually predatory. The, uh, the larvae are, are predatory and often they feed on aphids. And this is one of the reasons why these um, hoverflies are uh, so good in gardens for uh, for feeding on green fly and black fly um, and so on. Um, next to them you've got the, the bee and uh, wasp and ant nest special specialists. Um, then you've got a group of plant feeding um, <coughs> hoverflies and the larvae here are sometimes uh, agricultural or horticultural pests. Um, then you've got a set of hoverflies which are associated with uh, old forests in, in particular ancient woodlands and, and uh, the larvae feed and, and on, within dead wood or on the runs that come out of uh, sap, the sap runs that come out of damaged um, damaged trees or in the on rot holes within uh, that are filled with water within um, within old trees. Um, so they're often associated with ancient woodlands. Uh, then you've got a group which are aquatic, they live in, in water, or they're semi-aquatic, they live in sort of waterlogged soil. Uh, and one species in, in particular, which is associated just with half-submerged wood, um, and will only lay its eggs within, within there. It's a real habitat specialist. Uh, and then you've got um, dung specialists as well. And there's a small group, there's about half a dozen species where we actually don't know what their larva life cycle um, is. It's never been uh, it's never been observed, and actually that's true for some of our bees as well. Uh, some of our bees, we, we we don't know where they uh, where they make their, their nests. We can surmise from their their closest relatives, but they've never actually been been observed. So that just gives you a sense of how diverse these things are. Um, back to to the main groups of pollinators. Uh, of course we've got the butterflies, uh, about 60, 60 species of those, uh, and then the larger moths, about 800 species um, of those. And these vary enormously in their importance as pollinators. So even amongst the butterflies, for example, we have some species which never visit flowers. Um, the purple emperor, for example, um, only ever feeds on honeydew and tree sap as far as we know. Uh, they never come down out of the canopy to feed on, on flowers. Um, similarly with some of the, the, the moths, um, some of them don't actually have functional mouth parts. Uh, they do all of their feeding um, as caterpillars um, and, um, <coughs> excuse me, and um, gain all of their energy feeding from uh, from host plants uh, and actually they they don't have uh, mouth parts that are that are functional so they never visit flowers um baby what do you want to do you also want to help with packing Unum, can you turn your your mm -hmm. off please thank you <laughs> 
If anybody else hasn't turned the sound off, can they do it, please? Um, uh, we've got about 100 species of day flying moths there, things like the six spot burnet at the bottom there, or a uh, lunar hawk moth, uh, which is a fabulous moth. Again, a, a hornet's um, mimic, similar to that, uh, that uh, hoverfly species that I, that I showed you before. This is one of the clear wing moths, uh, so named because the, the, uh, the wings unusually are, are clear. Uh, then we've got the hawk moths, uh, and then things like noctuids and geometrids and so on, mainly nocturnal, uh, but actually really, really important uh, moths, uh, sorry, really, really important moths are really, really important pollinators, uh, particularly of things like bramble. Uh, if you go out on a, on a large bramble patch in the summer at night with a, with a torch and shine your torch in there, you'll see a lot of moths visiting those. Uh, those flowers. Uh, but because they're, they're nocturnal, uh, most pollination ecologists um, don't go out and, and study them in, in detail. Uh, the groups of pollen, group of pollinators, by far the most diverse group of pollinators, are the other pollinators, if you like. Hundreds of different species here. Flies, beetles, wasps, and, and so on. Uh, up in the top left there, you've got an anthemyid fly visiting a, a bud, buttercup. You've already seen that image of the, uh, the bee fly underneath it. Um, and then you've got these... Uh, beetles. You've got these soldier beetles, um, which are visiting uh, ragwort there, which... Um, are um, sometimes called bonking beetles because whenever you see them on, on flower heads there, they're almost invariably mating. Um, and I'll come back to that, that one in a, in a moment. Um, so again, really high diversity here within Bombylius, the bee flies, you've got four species, but the other flies, hundreds and hundreds of different species. And then you've got things like the, the social wasps, um, only 10 species of those, but if we include solitary and parasitic wasps, uh, and then things like the parasitica, the ichneumonids and so on, hundreds of species of those. Um, soul flies, we've got about 550 species, though again they vary in the extent to which they visit um, flowers. Uh, but beetles belonging to many, many different families, longhorn beetles in particular, or canf and cantharids, as in the case of the soldier beetles there. And again, they, var they vary a lot. And there's, <clears throat> there's a, an official government statistic for the number of different types of, um, of pollinators that we have in this country. And you often see it um, being cited in official documents from, from DEFRA and so on. And their official figure is uh, 1,500 species. Uh, but that is certainly way, way too low. Uh, and that's just a... Um, a figure that's come out of come out of nowhere, really. Um, I've seen um, a figure. Uh, so I did a, a back of the envelope calculation, which suggested that um, perhaps three thousand species in, in the UK were actually acted as, as pollinators. Um, Stephen Falk, who so you probably know the um, his field guide to. Bees of Britain and, and uh, Europe, uh, sorry, Britain and Ireland, uh, he thinks about 6,000 species. So it's, it's certainly many thousands of species. And if we think about why um, these insects actually visit um, flowers, um, certainly for, for the, the bees, uh, social and the solitary bees, they're collecting nectar from, from flowers, but they're also put, uh, collecting pollen that they're taking back to, to provision the nest so the larvae can feed on it. Um, cuckoo bees don't collect any pollen, but uh, they do collect nectar for their own energy requirements, so that's why they visit flowers. Uh, hoverflies, mainly uh, visiting for nectar, but they can feed on pollen as well. Uh, butterflies and moths are visiting for, for nectar. There are some, um, some uh, butterflies we, uh, which can feed on pollen, but they're, they're tropical species. We don't find them in this country. But then if we think about the other flies, uh, yes, they'll feed on nectar, certainly. Some will feed on, on pollen. Uh, 
Um, but uh, some of them are predatory and they sit on, on flowers waiting for predators to, uh, to arrive. Uh, sorry, for, for prey to arrive so they can predate upon them. Um, some of them uh, are sitting there waiting for mates to, uh, to arrive. Uh, and then if we think about that, that anthemiid fly that was uh, sitting in the buttercup, um, that, I, that I showed you earlier, uh, it was actually a, a, a cold day in the garden. It was sitting there actually heating up within, within the flower because of the parabolic shape of those uh, buttercup flowers. Flies often sit in the, in the middle and they absorb the, the, uh, the rays of the sun which are uh, focused into the center of the flower because of the shape of it. Um, and so heat is actually a, a reward there. <coughs> um, Beetles, similarly visiting for nectar and feeding on pollen and often uh, for, for mates. Uh, and wasps uh, only visit for nectar. Uh, they don't feed on, on pollen. Uh, there's a whole group of wasps called the pollen wasps, the, the, the Masaridae, uh, but they, they're not found in, in this country. Um, but they, all of our wasps in this country feed on, on nectar or they're there for, for prey. But some flower visitors are actually seed parasites. They're visiting flowers to to lay their eggs on the uh, in the in the flowers, so they can parasitize the uh, the developing seeds. But from the flowers' point of view, there are some flowers which actually offer offer no reward at all, and they are effectively parasitizing the uh, the pollinators. Um, best example um, of that is uh, a very common uh, plant that. If you're based in, in Britain and Northern Europe, you'll be familiar with this. Um, Aerum maculatum, uh, we call it lords and ladies or, or cuckoo pint. Um, and it is uh, a, uh, a plant with a very unusual floral structure. Uh, if you look at this dissected flower on, on the left there, uh, you can see it has this large um, leaf shaped bract which surrounds the, the collection of flowers, the, the inflorescence, uh, and forms a kind of, kind of chamber. Um, and that um, strange looking structure sticking out of the top there, looking a bit like a sausage, uh, is called the spadix. And it's actually a scent producing organ. Uh, and it also contains a, a big store of carbohydrate, um, which um, when this, this uh, plant flowers in, in spring, um, it uh, uses that store of carbohydrate to heat up um, the spadix, um, which disperses the, the scent further into the, the woodland than it might uh, otherwise go. Uh, and its pollinators are those small um, psychoded midges, or um, owl, owl midges uh, that you can see uh, in the bottom centre uh, picture there. Uh, which are very, very small, just a couple of millimetres in, in length, but you can see it's covered in pollen. Um, and these owl midges are attracted into uh, the, fl uh, the floral chamber by the, the scent. And I did some work with um, a guy at Kew uh, some years ago, and I got called Jeff Kite, who did um, an analysis of the, the scent components um, coming, the chemical components coming out of this scent. Uh, we discovered that actually the, the scent is almost identical to cow dung, which is where this, uh, this fly would normally be, be laying its eggs. Uh, so it's completely fooled into, into visiting the, um, the, the, the flowers. Uh, it offers no reward at, at all. Elsewhere in the world, however, the diversity of pollinators is, uh, is even greater. Um, birds are pollinators in uh, the subtropics and the tropics, hummingbirds in, in the New World, things like sunbirds in, in Africa and Asia, uh, down into Australia, um, honey eaters as well in, in Australia. Um, bats are pollinators, again, mainly in the subtropics and, and the tropics both in the new world and the, and the old world. Um, so different groups of, of uh, wasps and, um, and beetles to, to the ones that we have in, in this country um, act as pollinators. But then what seems like a strange uh, group of, poll of pollinators, um, the lizards. And if any of you saw the, uh, the article in The Guardian earlier this week um, about lizard pollination in some South African plants, uh, we're discovering that it's more common than we, than we used to believe. 
Um, and the same team that did that work on um, on the lizard pollination in South Africa, uh, which is headed up by a colleague of mine, Steve Johnson, has also worked on rodent pollination. Uh, and you can see this gerbil um, at the bottom left there visiting a, um, a Masonia lily in uh, the deserts of South Africa. <coughs> and um, picking a pollen on its on its nose there. Uh, and this lily um, smells exactly the way you might imagine a, uh, a mouse pollinated uh, flower to smell, kind of musty and yeasty and not altogether pleasant, but you can say that mice would be very, very attracted to it. Um, and then perhaps uh, even stranger uh, for, for some people, um, Earlier this month, we, we published this paper on um, specialized cockroach pollination in a, um, a plant in, uh, in China. I, I did the work with uh, Chinese colleagues and, and a, a colleague from Germany as, as well. Uh, and it's the first time that in, in this particular plant family, uh, specialized cockroach pollination has, has been observed. And actually globally, it's only ever been uh, observed in perhaps about 12, perhaps about a dozen um, plant species globally, but it's almost certainly under-recorded, particularly in the wet tropics. It's probably more, more common than we, than we think. So let's go back to that picture of um, a bee fly I showed you earlier and think about what makes insects and, and other animals effective um, pollinators. Um, well, first of all, the, the size of the um, of the insect has, or animals has, has got to fit the flower. Um, so it shouldn't, the, the insect shouldn't be so small that it doesn't contact the, uh, the reproductive parts of the, uh, of the flower, uh, nor so large that it completely swamps the, swamps the flower. So there's gonna be a fit in terms of size. Um, and so certainly in this, the case of this bee fly, the size against the, the size of the flower is, is pretty good. Um, if we think about hair, uh, another factor, hairiness is important, uh, or featheriness in, in the case of birds, of course, um, to be able to pick up the, uh, the pollen um, accident, accidentally on its, on its body. Uh, and again, bee flies are, um, are pretty hairy. Um, they're gonna be abundant as well. They're gonna move um, pollen around uh, um, quite, um, uh, um, in, in, in large amounts, they're going to be fairly abundant uh, to be effective. And also the behavior on the flower, they've, they've got to come into the flower from, from the right direction. If any of you have seen uh, holes in the, the base of your fuchsia flowers in the garden, uh, quite often they've been caused by bumblebees, which are, which are nectar robbing. They're going into the back of the flower to, ne to rob the nectar. Um, uh, the next uh, criteria is behavior between flowers. Are the insects actually moving between flowers of the same species? Because if they're dispersing pollen to a different uh, type of flower, then that pollen is going to be lost from, um, from, from the reproductive system of the, uh, of the plant. Um, and then the final criterion then is cleanliness, which seems like a, an odd one, but many bees actually clean their bodies between uh, visits to flowers. You often see this in honeybees, for example, as they're flying between flowers, they'll groom all of the pollen off their bodies and pack it into the, uh, the pollen baskets on their, on their back legs. And once it's, they're packed into the, uh, into the pollen baskets, again, the, the, that pollen is lost from the, from the plant's reproductive system. It can't, uh, pollination can't take place with that, um, with that pollen. So if you think about this, this picture of a, a bee fly visiting um, a cherry, um, it's certainly picking up pollen. You can see that it's contacting the anthers there, but what it's not contacting is the is the stigma. That's the the the, the stigma and the style, which is the, the the female reproductive parts, which are the green structures in the center of the um, of the the flower. Now, hopefully, when it moves on to a, to the next flower, it will contact those female reproductive parts. Um, but if it doesn't, then all it, it's doing is acting as a, um, as a nectar thief. Um, and that's why 
as pollination ecologists like my, like myself, we spend a lot of time actually observing the behavior of insects and, and vertebrates on, on flowers, just really ascertaining how their behavior um, and how all of these criteria like size and, and abundance and so on actually affects their, their abilities as, as pollinators. Because you can't assume that just because something is visiting a flower, it's acting as a, as a pollinator. Um, so that's that's a situation in, in the UK and, and to some extent kind of globally in terms of, of the diversity of different types of, of pollinators. Um, why should we be concerned about pollinators? Why should we be, be interested in them? Uh, why have I spent the last couple of years writing a, a whole book about them? Um, well, the simple answer is because they're so important. They're globally really, really important. Um, as I said, you know, most plant species, probably 90% of the 352,000 plant species globally um, are animal pollinated. And those plants in, in turn are the basis for the functioning of wild ecosystems. Without those plants, um, photosynthesizing and, and, and uh, making all that primary productivity, uh, there'll be nothing to support the animals which are dependent upon the plants. And then nothing to support the predators that are dependent upon the animals that are dependent upon the plants. And so if we didn't have those, um, those pollinators and the interactions with the flowers, then ultimately those most of those plant populations would would die out. Uh, we'd be left with the wind pollinated um, plants, which are in much lower lower diversity. Um, and as I'll show you in a in a moment, there's a strong correlation between the diversity of plants within a an ecosystem and the diversity of, of animals. So. Um, Plant, so pollinators and their interactions with flowers are absolutely vital for our uh, wild ecosystems. Um, but they're also, they're also really, really critical for agricultural productivity as well and for global food security. So about three quarters, about 75% of the most productive crop plants on the planet are animal pollinated. Um, Things like uh, different kinds of, of, of orchard fruit, apples, cherries, pears, and, and so on, uh, but also many of the different types of beans, uh, canola or, or um, all seed rape, um, of course, uh, but many uh, bananas, many, many other different types of types of crops. Uh, and we think that uh, that accounts for something over a third of, of world wild, wide yields um, globally. Uh, so it, it, it a, makes it put, makes a huge impact on on food security, um, and one of the ways of thinking about about that is in terms of um, what we describe as being ecosystem services, which are the benefits that are that are derived from from the natural world uh, by our, our society. And more and more, we're beginning to realise just how much we require the natural world for uh, uh, for the sustainability for the ongoing security of our, of our societies. So I said something about the, the diversity of uh, animal pollinated plants there, but what about the, the total diversity of pollinators themselves? Well, well again, I did a bit of a calculation of, a few years ago for a, for a review paper, and I worked out that something like 350,000 species of insects and birds, mammals, lizards as well, uh, act as pollinators. Um, if we think that our best estimate of, of global diversity of terrestrial animals, so not animals living in, in the oceans, but terrestrial animals is somewhere between three and five million species. Then what that means is that perhaps as many as one in 10 animal species might actually act as a pollinator um, somewhere in the world, um, particularly diverse within the tropics, of, of course, but um, even in, in Britain, you know, if, if Stephen Falk's um, calculation about diversity of, of insects that are pollinators in Britain is 6,000 is, is within the right sort of ballpark, um, that suggests that, you know, a high proportion of, of our, um, or at least a significant proportion of our insects in Britain are also uh, acting as, as pollinators. 
why does that matter? Why does it matter whether we've got 355 uh, so 350,000 species of pollinators or 35,000 species of pollinators or 3,000 or, or just 35. Um, well, it matters for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we know that wild plants can be adapted to particular pollinators. Uh, so if we go back to the, uh, the plant I showed you earlier, which was fly pollinated, Aerum maculatum or, or uh, lords and ladies, it only has a single pollinator in this country, that's those psychoded uh, midges, that's its only pollinator. It can't be pollinated by bees and it can't be pollinated by beetles, that's its only uh, pollinator. So without that pollinator diversity we will lose a large diversity of our plants. Uh, we also know that crop pollination is more effective if, if more species are involved. Uh, and again, honeybees are often thought of as being one of our main crop pollinators, but um, Tom Breeze and Simon Potts and, and some of the guys who work on agricultural pollination down at the University of Reading, they suggested that at most only 30% of the um, crop pollination in the UK is performed by, by honeybees. The other 70% is, is being performed by the wild pollinators. Um, and even if we could uh, maintain enough honeybee hives um, to do all of that crop pollination, uh, which we almost certainly can't, we, we, there's no way we can tri treble the number of honeybee hives in, in this country, but even if we could, reliance on a single species for crop pollination is a hugely risky strategy. We know the kinds of problems that, um, that honeybees have been having in terms of things like colony collapse disorder, uh, but also um, diseases, you know, varroa and so on, various viral diseases. Um, honeybees have pandemics too. Uh, so it's, so it's a, a, an extremely risky strategy. Um, but for natural historians like ourselves, I think this, this bottom point is, is important that what we are losing if we lose pollinators, if they go extinct, is the biodiversity heritage for our future generations, for our children, our grandchildren, our, our great grandchildren. And we know that we've already lost some of that. 23 species of bees and wasps have gone extinct in Britain um, since about 1850. Uh, and we've lost species of, of moths and butterflies as, as well. Many of our other butterflies and moths have become much, much less common. Uh, things like the garden tiger moth, which I used to see every summer when I was a child. I can't remember the last time I saw a garden tiger moth. I've certainly never seen one in, in my garden here in Northampton. Um, so we're losing a lot for, uh, that we should be passing on to, uh, to future generations. So with that in mind, let's think about some of the statistics around losses of, of um, uh, pollinators and the way that they're declining in, in the UK. And this is data, this is slightly out of date now. The, the, there's been a, um, an updated version of, um, of this that the, uh, the JNCC has, um, has produced, but it sh it's shown pre pretty much the same, um, the same pattern. Um, we've got, some really good data in in the UK, relatively long term data going back into the 1980s, showing how pollinator diversity has has changed in this in this country. Um, and so, if we look at that top graph uh, for changes in wild bees, that dotted line there at, at 100, that's the the position in in 1980. And as you can see, all through the 90s and into the early 2000s. Uh, there's been fluctuations around that line, but it's stayed fairly stable. Um, but in uh, around 2006, 2007, suddenly something started happening to, to our wild bee species, and many of them started to, to decline. And if you look at the bar chart to the right of that, um, <clears throat> you can see that over both the long term and the short term, uh, somewhere between 30, 15 and 30 percent of of our species of these species show a, a strong decline um, larger proportion um, a weak decline but for many there's no change and for some actually there, there was an increase so it's a real it's a real mixed um, mixed picture there 
Um, similarly, with the, with the hoverflies <coughs> um, at the bottom there, with the hoverflies, interesting, the, interestingly, the decline started in the mid 1990s, uh, which is when neonicotinoid pesticides were introduced into the UK for the first time. Uh, and whether there's cause and effect there, uh, and why that didn't actually affect the um, the bees, we um, we simply don't know. Um, but um, but again, there's it's a it's a, a mixed bag. But certainly, at least. Um, 17 or 18 percent of those uh, hoverflies are showing a, a strong decline um, over over the country. But other species are doing well. Others are, are, are showing a strong increase. So it's a, so it's a real mixed bag of um, of responses to uh, to a, a changing environment in the UK. Um, so if we think that you know 70 percent of the country is agricultural in one way or, or another. We know that farming practices have changed massively over the last 150 years. Uh, then a lot of that loss of diversity is, is due to changes in farming practices and plowing up um, species rich grassland. You know, we've lost about 97% of our wild flower meadows and so on over the last 50 years. Uh, increased use of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and, uh, and so on. All of that we know has had a, had a massive impact. Uh, but more recently, we know that climate change is beginning to have, have an impact. And some interesting modelling been done over the last few years uh, on the way in which bumblebees are likely to respond to climate change in, in the future. Um, and bumblebees are largely um, cold adapted bees. Uh, they're large, they're, they actually produce their own, uh, their own heat. Um, internally by vibrating the, the muscles of their thorax, they're hairy um, to, to insulate them against the cold, uh, and they're mainly adapted to, to cold conditions. And with increasing uh, temperatures, increasing aridity, particularly in Southern Europe, parts of Southern Europe um, over the next 50 years may lose most of their bumblebee species, and those species will be pushed further and further north. <clears throat> um, but it's, it's not all... Oh. Suzanne, can you, can you mute your... Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I lost the train of thought there. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, uh, getting back to what I said about it being a mixed bag of, of responses from different kinds of pollinators, um, since 2000, we've actually had about 14 new species of pollinators appear in, in the UK. Um, 11 or 12 of them are bees, the others are, um, are wasps. Um, and uh, they're doing, many of them are doing really well. Um, really good example is, um, is this species here, the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum which was unknown in Britain up until 2001, uh, when my friend and colleague Dave Goulson discovered it down uh, near the New Forest. Uh, and he published some that work with, with Paul Williams from the Natural History Museum in 2001. Uh, and what was originally a single, um, we think single population, single introduction of, of this species, uh, has now spread to cover most of uh, most of the country. And it's particularly associated with urban areas. And we think that this is a natural range expansion by, um, by this bee. Uh, it's also been ex ex um, expanding its range eastwards and westwards um, in uh, continental Europe, and it's found up in, in Scandinavia. Um, it may be a response to climate change, it may be a response to, to, to something else, but it's certainly um, uh, expanding its, its, its range um, without the immediate help of humans. And this is one of the things that I, th I think we need to appreciate is that um, species are not static in their distributional range, their ranges change over time. Um, and uh, often in the past, we've assumed that it's humans who are, who are doing that introduction, uh, but certainly it's, it's, it's not, the, not always the case by, by any means. And actually a really good example of, of that 
um, is the, the collared dove, uh, which up until the 1950s was almost unknown in uh, Northern Europe, and including Britain. Um, but then in the 1950s, it expanded its range from um, the Eastern Mediterranean and started to colonize the rest of Europe and ended up in the UK and became a very common breeding bird, um, particularly again in, in urban and suburban gardens. Um, and there's no suggestion that humans played a role in that. Uh, it's simply what some species do uh, for, for reasons that we don't fully understand they expand their, their range or contract their range. So it's not always humans that are, that are playing a role within, uh, within the changing distribution of species. Um, just sticking with urban environments then, and you know, I'm aware that that's, uh, the London Natural History Society is very much an urban natural history society. Um, we know that urban environments, even though they, they in the UK, they cover less than 10% of the land area, are really important for, for conserving pollinator to populations. And there's been quite a number of studies done now in the UK that shown that you, you have at least as much pollinator diversity in urban areas, and often more in urban areas as you do in the surrounding countryside. That's certainly true in, in uh, Northampton where, where I live. Um, we find more bees in the centre of town than we do in the surrounding uh, nature reserves. And there's a number of different reasons for that. Uh, part of it's floral diversity in gardens. Uh, we have uh, far more different types of plants growing in gardens than we find it in the, in, uh, in the surrounding countryside. Uh, longer flowering times, what we term flowering phenology, um, now it's very easy in urban areas to have plants uh, in flower 12 months of the year in your garden. Um, in part that's due to the warmer microclimate, uh, but also the choice of plants that, that we, we grow as well. Um, but then there's nesting opportunities in old walls and dry soil and, and so on, particularly for, for bees, um, the solitary bees, which are actually mainly warm adapted as opposed to the bumblebees. Uh, they're adapted to warmer conditions. Uh, they find those conditions really conducive. Um, so one of the ways to, th ways to think about conservation of pollinators is in urban areas or in, um, uh, in nature reserves and, and so on, is to think about what, what pollinators need in order to complete their, um, their life cycles. Um, so this is something, this comes uh, directly from, from my book. It's something I developed as in one of the chapters within, within the book uh, on, on the chapters on, on uh, managing and restoring habitats for pollinators. And I call it the, the requirements of pollinators triangle. Uh, and it's really just thinking about the three broad categories of requirements that, that pollinators need if they're actually going to um, have uh, sustainable populations in a, in a given area. Um, now the, the first thing that we think about of course is, is flowers. Uh, pollinators by their very nature need flowers to, to feed on or to visit for, for whatever reason. Um, and some of those flowers in some cases they're, they're, they're quite specialist interactions with, with the pollinators. Um, a diversity of flowers are important, but also abundance as well. Uh, particularly for, for the social bees, they, they require a large abundance of resources to be available to maintain their, their colonies. Uh, and the flowering time is important as, um, as well. Um, so, uh, this is from a, from a review I did a few, a few years ago where I looked at studies that had um, uh, uh, counted the number of, of plant species within, a, within a, an ecological community and counted the number of pollinator species. Um, and as you can see, there's, a, there's a, a really strong positive correlation there between the number of plants within a, um, a community and, and the number of pollinators. So the more plants that you uh, you have within a, a community the more different types of pollinators you have uh, as a rule of thumb for every plant species you you put in you get somewhere between one or two uh, new pollinator species and that's true for gardens as well as for wild plant 
communities. Um, gardens, uh, even non-native garden plants will attract pollinators that otherwise wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be present. Um, but the flowering time, the extended flowering time in urban areas, as I said, is, is really important. Uh, and here's a really nice um, example of a, um, a hedgerow tree, uh, which plays a really key role in, in some parts of, of Britain, particularly in the Midlands and, and further south. Um, it's a species of prunus called cherry plum or myrobalan plum, um, which is our earliest flowering hedgerow shrub. Sometimes people see this flowering even as early as, as February and um, think that it's, it's blackthorn slow, which is flowered early, uh, but actually it's a, it's a different species. And it's, it's a long established introduction. It might even have been brought in from, by, the, uh, by the Romans. Um, but from February onwards, this is visited by a really wide diversity of early um, emerging insects, uh, early emerging hoverflies that have overwintered, um, early emerging uh, queen bumblebees um, and so on. Really, really important. Um, the second corner of our requirement of pollinators triangle relates to reproduction uh, and the, the, the reproductive life histories of these, these pollinators. Uh, and it could be specific host plants in the case of butterflies and moths, where the caterpillars are feeding on specific host plants. Could be specific nesting sites um, in the case of uh, some of our bees, uh, or particular kind of micro habitats as well. I'll just to give you some examples here. Um, so this is an urban uh, flower, flower rich bank um, in uh, Kettering in Northamptonshire. And you can see on the right hand side there, if you look at it from that direction, uh, there's quite a reasonable diversity of wild plants there that are providing nectar and pollen for, uh, for the pollinators. If you look at it from the other direction though, you'll see uh, that part of the bank has actually been mown quite close to the uh, to the soil um, and this has actually been done deliberately to provide a, um, a, a nesting site um, uh, for mining bees uh, particularly within the genus Andrina uh, so they actually nest within that part of the uh, of the grassland and feed on the nectar and pollen in the flowers on the other side of the um, of the of the uh, of the bank, and by changing um, the area that's mown between years, you can actually maximise plant diversity and and pollinator diversity within uh, within that area. And here's another example. Um, I mentioned, you know, going back to the to hoverflies, uh, that some hoverflies are associated with dead wood, you know, old trees in ancient woodlands, or with these water-filled rot holes, um, and that's where they they lay their eggs. That's where the larvae develop. Um, but these uh, these areas also uh, act as as hibernation sites for uh, for some hoverflies, like that marmalade hoverfly there at the at the bottom. Um, that's not actually a, a species which lays its eggs in, in rot holes or dead wood. Um, it's actually a, a, one of the predatory um, hoverflies, um, but it, it has been probably overwintering in one of these hollow, uh, hollow trees. Um, I mentioned butterflies and moths as specialist host plants. Uh, this is a privet hawk moth. Um, and sitting on the, the hand of my next door neighbor, Terry. Uh, so be, between our, our houses or between our gardens, we have this, uh, this privet hedge. And um, every year we see uh, privet hawk moth caterpillars uh, feeding on that privet, as the name suggests, that's the, uh, the only food plant. Um, and every year we find these adult um, hawk moths come to, um, coming to lay their eggs and to, to feed on flowers within, within the garden. Uh, and they're, they're fabulous uh, and spectacular insects. And similarly, this is also within, within the garden, cinnabar moth, um, which is um, a specialist on different types of, of ragworts. 
Um, and in the garden, I keep a little patch of, of ragworts um, uh, unmown so that these uh, caterpillars can, um, can feed on them. And we've kept this population going in the garden for um, going on eight years now. Uh, and it comes back year after year. <clears throat> and then the final um, uh, corner of the of the pollinators triangle uh, is what I term supplements or, or supplemental resources. Uh, this is additional food or nesting materials or hibernation sites um, that uh, that pollinators might might require. Uh, and I'll give you some examples in, in a moment. But, but without all of these three requirements being met for, for pollinators, either in gardens or in nature reserves and, and so on, um, particular types of pollinators may not uh, have, have su sustainable, successful populations within those, um, uh, those areas. Uh, but some examples of, of what I mean by supplements um, so this is a, a queen hornet um, feeding on, on nectar from ivy, which is an incredibly important um, autumn, uh, late summer and, and autumn nectar source for many different types of pollinators which, which overwinter, which hibernate. Uh, but this hornet, will, once it's fed, up on, uh, fed as, on as much nectar as it requires, um, it will uh, need somewhere to hibernate. Uh, could be within a hollow tree or a cave or inside a, a shed or a, or a garage in urban areas. Uh, but it also requires insect prey for, uh, to, to start its colony the, uh, the next year. And hornets, um, along with other kinds of wasps, are of course um, predatory. So the insect prey has got, got to be present. Uh, and then things like uh, some, of the, some of the bees actually have specialist requirements. Uh, so this is a female leaf cutting bee, a megachile species. And as the name suggests, um, they cut sections of, of leaves out from, uh, uh, from, from plants. Um, in gardens, it's quite often uh, roses, for example. Uh, and they the females carry these uh, pieces of leaves back into the nest. Uh, and they line the inside of the of the nest uh, with it, um, and produce, make make individual cells out of out of these leaves. And so, if you don't have um, suitable leaves within the area in which the uh, the bees can forage, uh, then you won't have populations of of leaf cutting bees. Uh, this is an example of a of a hibernation site. Uh, which is uh, often springing up in, in urban areas. This is in uh, a park in Northampton uh, called Beckett's Park. Uh, and this is the Beckett's Bug uh, Bed and Breakfast B&B, &B, uh, where a lot of insects will be, will be overwintering within there. But something to consider if, if you've got a garden and you're thinking about um, managing your your garden or could be an urban nature reserve or an urban patch for for pollinators something to consider is, is that gardens urban patches sit within a much wider landscape and quite often even if your garden doesn't provide the resources that all of the pollinate the pollinators that you want to attract require other parts of the landscape may well provide those those resources um, so if we consider London for, for a moment, and it's just a Google Earth shot of, of part of central London, um, it obviously looks grey and, and, and uh, darkened and concreted or, or tarmac, but there's little patches of, uh, of green within there, green habitat with, within there. But if we zoom out for, from, from that um, point um, and draw... Um, a line westwards, uh, two and a half kilometres in, in length. Um, that is a typical uh, distance travelled by foraging bumblebees or honeybees on a, on a single trip. Certainly a bumblebee could fly that in probably 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how often it's stopped off to, uh, to visit flowers. So even though it's um, a bumblebee or a honeybee hive might, might be uh, present in a garden uh, where that red marker is, 
um, actually it can be flourishing and, and, and foraging uh, over a much, much wider area. Uh, and the same is true of some butterflies and moths and some hoverflies as, as well. Um, some of them travel very, very long distances uh, to forage and to find suitable um, egg laying sites in the, in the case of butterflies and, uh, and hoverflies. And in fact, some butterflies and hoverflies, of course, are, are migratory. Uh, they come up from North Africa or, or Southern Europe um, in the summer. Um, and that's why you get a big influx of marmalade hoverflies, for example, toward the end of summer. Uh, they're coming up and migrating in from, from Europe. So they can travel considerable distances. Um, on a smaller scale, something like a kilometre, some of the larger solitary bees, the larger hoverflies as well, will easily forage over, over that sort of distance. But once you start getting down to uh, just a 100 or 200, perhaps 300 metre radius of, a, of an area, some of the small solitary bees will, uh, will spend their whole life uh, within within that uh, that area, uh, likewise the small hoverflies. So by and large, the, there's a positive relationship, a positive correlation between the size of a bee or a hoverfly and the distance it will it will typically fly. Um, so it's something that's worth worth bearing in mind when you're thinking about having a garden for pollinators. Is where do, where does your garden sit within that wider landscape context? So, uh, just to kind of summarise what I've what I've been saying there, um, hopefully I've convinced you that there's there's more to pollinators than than just honeybees, uh, or even just bees generally. Uh, pollinators are incredibly diverse, um, and that diversity is is really important. I think it, it beholdens us to uh, to do what we can to conserve them. Um, because that, that value, uh, the value of pollinators, the natural world and to human society as a whole is, is absolutely massive. And um, yeah, I think that their conservation uh, and the conservation of their habitats should be um, an absolute priority. Uh, so there's a link for my, um, my blog, uh, if you're interested in keeping up with some of the things that, I, that I've been doing. I, I blog and, and post on there fairly, fairly frequently, at least once a week. Uh, and yeah, the, the book should be out very, very shortly. I know quite a number of people have pre-ordered it and hopefully it'll, it'll be with you before Christmas. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to answer any questions that, have, that have, might have come in. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely fascinating talk and we, we've, we've let it overrun a bit, but I think that's been great because we've <laughs> so engaged and yeah. you've a lot of ground you talked about that you know the stressing the diversity of pollinators that really kind of opened my eyes really and i found very interesting the way that um the different insects and or other you know kind of range of animals were using flowers in very different ways which i think i probably not fully appreciated as well and certainly stressing how important these kind of flower pollinator interactions are for ecosystems and for agriculture and you know and kind of for us that was you know that's really significant we're going to just very quickly maybe take a couple of questions, but we'll, we will need to keep that very brief because I'm conscious that, you know, people sometimes have other things they need to go off to. But um, Anka, is there a, are there a, one or two questions we could just pick up on? If, if are, are you managing able to do that, Anka, or do you want me to? Uh, to sorry, I thought it was... <laughs> I thought I unmuted myself, but apparently not. Um, I have no talent in that respect. Um, so I was looking at, you know, some of the questions. There are quite a few questions. Some were kind of answered by other people. Um, but there's one that's kind of interesting because you talked a lot about some of the, the night flyer um, pollinators. Okay. And so um, Leslie Wertheimer was asking, are the night flyers affected by lighting, you know, as in from, you know, the buildings in, in city centers and, you know, in, less urban areas are kept lit all night. So are they impacted by that? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I think the short answer is yes. I think, you know, we know that uh, the, the behavior of uh, night flying insects is, is affected by, by light. Um, whether or not that actually then has an impact on their population size, um, who knows? Uh, but certainly it, it could affect uh, pollination of, of 
urban plants that are that are growing nearby. Um, and actually, I, I just noticed a question that, that related to this, which which popped up there from Annie, who said, uh, "What do you think of the main areas of pollination ecology needing more res further research at the moment?" And actually, nocturnal pollination by moths. Uh, is one area that absolutely we need to do more work on. Um, because actually there are more species of moths probably acting as pollinators globally uh, than all of the rest of the, in the insect pollinators put together, uh, as far as we were aware. Uh, and a lot of plants are adapted to nocturnal pollination or pollination during the day and the night. Uh, so I think they're, in they're incredibly important. They may even be more important than the, um, than the bees. Well, I mean, just to kind of um, expand on, um, well, Annie's question about, you know, really important issues that need to be researched now. I mean, obviously you just talked about the nocturnal um, pollinators. Um, and there was another question about what you felt the most pressing issues were for pollination and agriculture. So do you see, besides the nocturnal pollinators, other issues that really need to be investigated and researched? Well, the pesticides are, are the big one, of course. Um, and one of the problems that we've had up until now, uh, well, there's, there's, there's two related problems. One is that all of the testing on uh, uh, of pesticides has been done on uh, honeybees, using honeybees as, as a model system. And as I said at the beginning, honeybees are not very good uh, not a very good representation of bees. Uh, only a small percentage of, of the 20,000 species of bees globally are actually um, uh, social in, in that way. Uh, so, so, so that's part of the problem. The other problem is that, that, that these pesticides are never tested um, in uh, combination with other kinds of pesticides, or you know, with fungicides and herbicides and, and so on. And we know uh, there's a growing body of evidence from work people like Dave Goulson and so on, uh, that there can be synergistic combinatory effects from, uh, from these different pesticides. So that's certainly an issue. Um, but actually, I, I, even more than that, I think the issue of loss of habitat is a, is a massive one. You know, we, we can't expect to lose 97% of our wildflower meadows and for that not to have an impact on diversity and abundance of, of pollinators, we, we can't. And I know that a lot of conservation organizations are working to restore uh, many of these habitats, uh, but we're not doing enough and it's not uh, on a large enough scale and these areas are not being connected together. Because that's going to be one of the key things for climate change, making sure that these natural areas are actually connected together so that species can move um, through them. So I think we're going to have to draw things to a close now, but that's certainly pointing out some things that, you know, need serious thought and serious uh, input in order to, to, to combat what really, you know, quite worrying changes. I mean, particularly and, and relatively recent, the kind of the losses that you were showing amongst things like the hogfires and bees, where that's relatively recent, the shift. And then so we've got climate change and then we've got change in agricultural practice and things, you know, where, where we're going to need to kind of really look carefully at both of those uh, alongside the work that conservation uh, organisations are doing, you know, more directly in their reserves and so on. But thank you so much. I, you know, we could have quite happy talk all evening, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I tend to overrun on these things. 